So thank you all for coming out and listening to me yammer on for a little while here. Uh, my name is Miles. I'm coming out from Hive Mapper, as you can see by the, the nice screens behind me here. So we are a software company based out in California, just south of San Francisco. Uh, we also have offices in DC working a lot with some of the customers such as yourselves. Uh, we've been around for about three, three and a half years. And what we have built is a software product for ingesting airborne video and automatically building fully geo-registered 3D maps for analytics from that content. So bringing in all the various collections you've got from different aircraft, different sensors, different altitudes, and bring that all into one centralized system. Uh, our team is made up of a variety of different people from mapping backgrounds, analytics backgrounds, software startups, uh, computer vision, uh, algorithms, analytics, a whole bunch of different aspects. And we try to bring all of that work together into the system that I'll talk about today. So looking at the mapping space, as you sort of back up, historically, you know, going back you know, tens of years, you know, back into the 80s, 70s, satellite imagery was really the leader of mapping data, uh, bringing in you know, hundreds of terabytes a day of information. But fundamentally, we're seeing that shift now. And this is really what the start of HiveMapper began into what we've been trying to coin sort of VLR, video, LIDAR, and radar data. Uh, I think we've all been seeing that everything from handhelds to DJI drones to you know, different systems going on, self-driving cars and everything in between. And the amount of data coming in from that is fundamentally just exploding. There's no other way to describe that to use the catchphrase. And that's really what HiveMapper is built to ingest. So we're not just working with that sort of more static 2D data, the more centralized system where you need to have a constellation or very large, expensive pieces of equipment going up in satellite form. We can have very low cost, diffuse sensors. I mean, literally, eventually, you know, the sensors in our pocket can be feeding all this data back for what HiveMapper can be using. So to take a step back a little bit, I, when I was preparing for this talk and this discussion, I went back to the XTech Search website, and I thought this area and this section of it really jumped out to me, specifically that third bullet, which is the point of this event is to provide mentorship and expertise to accelerate, mature, and transition technologies of interest to the Army, and in my mind, the broader DOD and government as well. Uh, and so with that in mind, I wanted to sort of step back and walk through what HiveMapper's story has been going through this competition, going back to July of 2018 when we first presented to you all. Uh, so back then, we were you know, still a similar platform working to strive to ingest this airborne video, but we really could only build 3D point cloud maps. Our UI was pretty early on in its development, pretty rudimentary. You could really only view single videos at a time. Uh, from a change detection perspective, you were pretty locked in in terms of how you viewed the data, what it looked like, how you could interact with it. Uh, and although we were very proud of what we'd built at that point, we saw a much bigger future, which led us to this competition. So jumping forward a few months to October, uh, we're now starting to experiment with IR data. We're trying to open up the scope of what we can process. Uh, we're also experimenting with textured mesh and getting much more photorealistic maps of the world, not just that 3D point cloud data, although both of which are obviously hugely valuable. Uh, and now it gets us to today. We've done, spent the last six months and a lot of the investment from the XX Search competition to really open the scope of what our platform can do and again, hopefully how it can be valuable to teams of people and analysts on the ground. And obviously, judges here, feel free to jump in if you have questions, hold them to the end, whatever you prefer. Happy to have you interrupt any time. Uh, so we've really worked the last six months to open up and truly turn our system into an agnostic platform for airborne video working with everything from low altitude, commercial off the shelf camera systems and platforms like DJI drones, all the way up to the high altitude DOD spec, both IR and EO sensors and gimbal systems like what you see here. Uh, and pretty soon we're gonna be moving also the other direction down to ground base. That's a pretty big project we have coming up. Dash cams, handhelds, things of that sort. And what our system is designed to do is bring again any of that data in, build these 3D maps and make that data available for an analyst on the ground to do the work that they need to do, whatever analytics that might be for a variety of different use cases. Uh, although by no means an exhaustive list here, some of the ones we're doing both in the government and commercial world, things like asset tracking, I wanna know how my property is changing, how my construction project is developing, if I'm a real estate analytics kind of expert on how the city is growing, where there are new parks showing up, new apartment buildings being constructed. Uh, security, I wanna know how my area is being impacted. Did a car get parked next to my fence and left there for days on end? Did a new bush magically show up along the border that wasn't there before? You know, seeing how these areas are evolving, especially in things that a human who's just staring at a security camera or driving by for their patrol might not notice just because it would fit in very cleanly in the environment. Uh, autonomous navigation, how do you actually plan out routes, both ground and airborne, to know where are obstacles? Where is every tree, every pole, every building, every courtyard? 
uh, especially in the commercial world, doing that for drone delivery. I want you to know where those obstacles are, or my drone or my package is going to get stuck at the top of a tree, and that doesn't help whoever needs it on the ground, especially when you're thinking about things like medical supplies. And again, lastly, though by no means the full list, damage assessment. An event has happened, man-made, it could be a natural disaster, it could be whatever it might be, and I need to know the impacts to that part of the world and what that means for my organization. So let's dive into what that looks like in practice. So this is now the updated UI that we've been building the last six months. Uh, we like to think it's much more a user-intuitive workflow. Uh, when you click on the map, you actually now are given this list of every single video that's ever seen that specific place of the world. And if you can see within the frame, there's actually a yellow pin that correlates inside the frame of the video with the specific point that you clicked on the 3D map itself. And what we're doing there is we're breaking open every video. We're extracting all that 3D data, building out this map, and geotagging roughly every pixel of every frame that we process with that coordinate system in the 3D world in both latitude, longitude, and altitude. So I like to call this the click anywhere feature, because you can click on any bush, any tree, any window, uh, any parked car, whatever it is, and be able to index and pull back all of your historic data to assess whatever might actually be happening on the ground at that given day and truly see what the actual camera operator or pilot saw at that moment. Similarly with change detection, we've come quite a long way here in terms of its usability and its, I think, clarity from an analytics perspective. Uh, if any time you collect over an area you've already seen, this could be 10 minutes later, it could be 10 years later, we can bring back and flag all these changes that have happened, vegetation, terrain, man-made structures, construction equipment, flag that for an analyst, and similarly with that Click Anywhere feature, click on the map and bring up this before and after viewpoint and see, again, tagging in the frame of the video, where have you selected, where's of interest to the person on the ground who's looking at this work. Uh, now, when you look at these, I kind of want to call out a few things. To start off with, look at the before and after. You might notice that the shadows are very different. The color balance is a little bit different. I happen to know, just because from this collection, that the aircraft and the camera being used between these two flights are entirely separate platforms. And what that means behind the scenes is that we're not using the sort of the classic pixel-to-pixel -pixel change detection methodology. We take two images, figure out how to line them up, and then kind of go through and flag where the colors don't match. Uh, the problem with that is when you're starting to mix different technologies, different sensors, if it's a sunny day versus a cloudy day, if you happen to get a slightly different angle on your picture, all that data can get thrown out the window and just is not usable. Where in our platform, what we've done is we take your first collection, build a full 3D map of that region, second collection, totally independent 3D map, figure out where those are in space in relation to each other and where the overlap is, and calculate all the three-dimensional changes happening in that part of the world. And so that's how we can really open up what we can accept and what we can work with from an analytics, and again, the automated change detection perspective. Um, the other thing I should have mentioned this earlier is all this is done just through your web browser. There is no desktop application you have to install, uh, so this is literally us doing screen recordings just because conference Wi-Fi, I don't, I don't trust it for demos. Uh, but it's just screen recordings of literally our browser to show this. So do you have a question? So how much a priori information do you need in order to uh, do that registration? Yeah, so I've got a whole section on geo-registration, so I'll answer it very lightly now and dig in later. Uh, we can go from uh, very little to almost no information from the collection itself and such information on the ground, or the other side of that is have information from the collection and less on the ground. And we can pull those two things together, but I'll, I'll somewhat pause on that because I've got a bunch to dig into on that, I promise. And if I don't answer at the time, just jump in. Uh, again, I mentioned we want to be mixing and matching technologies. So in this case, you're looking at a map that we built just from airborne video, and now looking at change detection against historic LIDAR data that was collected in this case from 2012. We can also view that LIDAR data. This is actually a neighborhood in Santa Rosa. Uh, the LIDAR data was before the fires. Uh, the imagery, obviously, is from after the fires, unfortunately. Uh, but looking at this change detection is we can be mixing and matching in a 3D space how that part of the world is evolving and updating, be triaging that damage, be knowing, okay, neighborhood A, severely damaged, neighborhood B, not too bad, C, really bad, D, they actually are okay, and be deciding where we need to send our resources and how we need to help recover from whatever has happened on the ground. Uh, and again, the whole thing here is all this is automated. There's no human going in and lining these up. There's nobody creating the models. There's no one flagging the changes. Uh, there's no hive mapper engineer in the background doing anything. This is purely the software, upload a video, let it do its thing, and then just review the results just through your web browser and nothing else. Uh, I did also promise we could mix and match technologies. So in this case, you see on the left is a 4K RGB video from just an SUAS flying at roughly 300 feet above ground level. Uh, and on the right, you've got an IR sensor actually from that same gimbal system we saw earlier. Uh, it's a 720p video, so you can see the detail is much lower on the right, flying at nearly 8,000 feet. Totally different flight pattern. One was a grid, one was an orbit, different days. 
Uh, I think there's about seven months, you can see in the dates, if it's, sorry, it's a little small for you, but it's about seven months between the two collections and still doing this change detection and showing that these trees that here on red, which were damaged in the fire, that were still there when we did the first flight, have now been removed by the time the second flight came through. Uh, so we really want to be, again, that agnostic system. We don't care what sensor you're using, was it IR, is it EO, we don't care if you're flying you know, a COTS or a GOTS or a manned aircraft, unmanned aircraft, helicopter. Uh, we've done everything from literally 30 feet off the ground to just shy of 20,000 feet and a little bit higher, actually. Uh, and it really, the idea from our side is you all already have collection platforms out there. You've got methodology, you've got TTPs, you know how you fly it, you've got trained pilots, trained camera operators. You want to use the data you're already bringing in, and so we want to be able to come to that data rather than asking you to change the way you do your collection. So one, one, that I, one example I found kind of interesting here is when we were doing that collection with that, it was the FLIR Star Sapphire specifically, uh, that high altitude gimbal system. It has two cameras in there. It has both an ER and an IR, or EO and an IR sensor that are paired and always looking at the same thing. The EO sensor is a 1080p and the IR is a 720p. So on paper, the EO should give you better results. And what I found interesting here is if we do look at the same data on IR, we actually saw the opposite. So I'll focus your attention sort of in the middle of the map here, sort of where there's terrain and the hillside, and I'll toggle back and forth for a second. And I think what you'll see is that the IR sensor brought back noticeably more data, even though this was, I think, roughly one in the afternoon, something like that. And the reason for that is we're flying at a smoggy area. There is atmospheric interference. We're at about that 8,000-foot mark again, I think, in this case, maybe 10. And the IR sensor was just able to cut through that data, or sorry, cut through that interference and make that data much more available to the people on the ground. And sort of the lesson learned, and maybe this was already obvious to the, the panel here, but at least lesson learned for our team was, again, the importance of opening up the scope of the amount of different sources of data we can ingest from different platforms, different airborne, different technologies, just because there's a huge amount of data going on and, and honestly expertise out there in the field that we maybe don't know yet. And so I'd be able to work with whatever you have already selected to fly. We can then give you hopefully the most amount of data back for your work. Uh, and again, at the end of the day, we are building a map. It needs to be able to do measurements, you need to have coordinates, you need to know location in the world, and you know how long is this football field, I need to know how tall is this building, whatever kind of work I need to do there. So building a map is one thing. Building independent models is even, I think, in my mind, less useful. One of the big things we added recently is what we're calling our global terrain base map data. So we went out as things part of the uh, Amazon open data. We can pull in this global terrain layer and actually lay that out around the world and then be overlaying the 3D maps that we are building from your video on top of that data. And so using this as an example, what we see here is these two regions of this refinery where we've flown this with our airborne video on either side of this hillside, but this whole region in the middle and going north and south, we don't have any information about that. We haven't flown it yet, we don't have any video from it, but we can still impart this knowledge and this context to the teams on the ground so they know if they're coming in from the northwest, there's a hillside that's gonna be maybe in their way they need to hike over or fly over. If they're coming in from the west side, okay, there's a nice open flat region. Sure, there might be other features in the way, other buildings, other trees, but we at least know the terrain concept before we show up at that moment. So really trying to kind of open up the scope of that broader context so that we can work with as much as you have and then continue to update it. If you were to fly this region northwest on this hillside today, upload that video, however could build out that map, stitch it in, connect it to the data you already have, and just start updating the amount of information we have about those regions more and more over time. Uh, and again, I'll say this again, and I'll probably say it a few more times, mixed collection is the big thing for us. So this is an area we did down in El Paso with the Border Patrol. You can see we weren't able to fly on the southern border, uh, or south of the border in this case, but we still have that terrain to give us context of what's out in the distance. So if you're doing a patrol along that border line, you know what's gonna be on the other side of that border, even if we can't survey it ourselves. Uh, we also have a mix of different collection platforms. So this is showing the result of that click anywhere result we talked about earlier. And the top few results here, the slightly more grayish hue, uh, are all from low altitude, just commercial platforms. I just happen to know that so I can clarify it. That were flown about a month later than the more yellowy hue at the bottom, which is back at that higher altitude manned aircraft. But as an analyst, you shouldn't care. It doesn't matter to you whether it was a DJI or a Cessna or a Predator that flew over a target to give you back the data that you have on the ground. You just need to know what is there, how old is this data, and what can I see in that region to be able to answer your questions. And really, again, pull all that information together. So even building by building, block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, you can be stitching together whatever information, as much information as you have available to you. 
Related to that and the idea of this base map data is LIDAR information. So I'm sure people here are very familiar with LIDAR. We looked at it a little bit earlier from a change detection perspective. Uh, so HiveMapper I actually think is one of the, if not the first actual API customer of a system known as Grid. If you're not familiar with Grid, if you Google Grid LIDAR, it'll come up. Uh, it's an NGA run program. There's both an unclassified and classified version of Grid. And we actually can plug into either one depending on where you're deploying HiveMapper. And every time you upload a video to our system, it is able to build that 3D map, figure out where in the world that is, and then reach out to Grid and say, hey, do you have any LIDAR in this region? If so, we can pull it in, align it with the data, do that change detection for you, all that stitching work, and just present it again to you in your browser with no human intervention at any step along the way there. Uh, you can also reach out yourself and say, I want to import more LIDAR from Grid that I didn't get, or I want to import my own third-party LIDAR. From our perspective, we want to bring any of that in. And just from a sense of scale, so you know, the unclassified LIDAR has, I think, roughly don't quote me this exact number, but about 2 million plus square kilometers of US data covering various cities, counties, you know, there's USGS data in there. There's very different sources that are all pulling it together that our system is able to pull in, because again, we don't want to care where you're getting your data from. We just want to help you get access to be able to use that information. Uh, another new one, we actually just launched this about, let's see, about three weeks ago, actually, uh, is support for exporting the full 3D textured maps uh, out of HiveMapper, right? This isn't our data. We don't own your information when you upload it to us. So you can export this out, throw it into something like Unity, and one of our actual DoD customers is using this to put it then into VR environments. They want to be able to put on goggles and walk through the scene as preparation for operations training, mission planning. I want to know if I stand right here behind this tree, what can I see and what can see me? If I'm looking at satellite imagery, I can get a sense for that. If we spend hours or days or weeks trying to manually build a model of that town, I hope it's accurate and I hope I can rely on that information. Depends on how much time probably you put into building that model. Uh, or what we're working on them for the idea is just saying, do one orbit flight around that scene, even from a high altitude kind of covert collection platform, bring back that data, build out a 3D map, throw on your goggles and you can walk through that scene and understand what you're looking at. So here we're seeing an example, just a small snippet of a region in the 3D textured mesh maps that we exported out, dropped into Unity, and then that can go into all sorts of different platforms. Um, fundamentally, I mean, just not to be blunt, you know, we don't care which platform you want to use. We want to be able to plug into whichever one the team in question really needs to use. And so that's why we use Unity and 3D OBJ files as sort of a generic, non-proprietary spec that works in a lot of different systems. Uh, as well as custom map layers. This is uh, an interesting one that we're actually launching, and uh, we launched a beta about this about a week ago which is that all of you have massive amounts of data, tons of geospatial information. You know patrol routes. You know who owns a coffee shop. You know how people live in a building. You know your own information about your compounds. Whatever it is that you have throughout your different systems and all your different analytics platforms on flat files and CSVs, whatever it is. And so what we have built now is the idea that you can bring in this non-geospatial, non-imagery data with location information and overlay that on the map. So what we're looking at here, for instance, are Stanford shuttle bus routes around the campus. Uh, you can obviously extrapolate that out to be any kind of traversal route, patrol route, exfil planning route, whatever it might be. And you want to see how that relates to the actual 3D data that we have generated from the various airborne platforms. Uh, and hold those, again, side by side, turn them on and off, import your own data sets, whether it be from GeoJSON or KML or other formats, and see what your data would look like in this environment to, again, extrapolate out and help your analytics to have that much more context on what's going on in that part of the world. And it's not just lines. You, know, you can do polygons, points, text, details. Uh, we're actually expanding this out to be 3D data in the next few weeks. So you can have additional 3D contextual information around a region uh, to, again, we're really trying to impart upon you whatever information you need about that region. And this example, actually, I think is a really interesting one that we did a pretty deep dive on with some of our state and local customers around disaster response where they're saying a fire has gone through this area, I need to know every road that's been blocked, I need to know every building that's been damaged, if I need to get somewhere to evacuate somebody to a hospital, how hard is it gonna be for me to get there on road versus air and various paths? So this is a region in Santa Rosa, California again. This is a fire that happened in 2017. This wasn't two weeks ago or two months ago, this was almost two years ago. Now on the left is what Google Maps' satellite imagery shows when I made this slide about three weeks ago. On the right is what we were able to build from the airborne collections, what we did in partnership with that state and local system. And so you can see, fundamentally, they're not the same world. It's not the same information. If you need to get to a house on this cul-de-sac in the middle here, and the fastest way for you to get there is to go to the cul-de-sac just to the west and walk over, but you need to know, is there a tree there? Is there a rubble there? Is there a building there that will be in my way? 
because that could be the difference of getting there fast enough. I'm like, you can't answer that question with standard commercial satellite imagery, uh, or even sometimes non-commercial satellite imagery, because it can't refresh with the speed and the detail that you need to answer those questions, where task an aircraft, five minute flight or less around that region, we can give you an answer to that question for an entire city uh, within hours or less, so that you can be planning out your routes and your details for the entire region in response to an event like this fire, as an example. So, geo-registration, come back to your question. I promise I wasn't ignoring it. Uh, we're able to do full geo-registration. This is something that we are patent pending right now. We've built an entirely new way to do geo-registration from these airborne collections. And we use a variety of different data sets, basically, depending on what's available uh, to our system. So, I'll actually work from the bottom up in this example. So, no base map data. This is the idea that we've got no satellite, we've got no LIDAR, we've got no GPS information. We just have nothing but a straight video. Uh, in that world, although we can't do a full geo-registration because we don't have any information about it, we're still able to build the full 3D map of what's seen in that region. So we actually don't need any GPS data, any metadata, any LIDAR data, any ground-based data to build that 3D structure. Here's a building, here's a tree, here's a park. Uh, we just can't do that full geo-registration without some more of that information. Uh, sort of similar to the last group that was talking about needing sort of that first initial point to base off of. Similar concept for us. Uh, now, if there's satellite data and nothing else, uh, our system will let you do automatic tie points against that. It'll figure out from the 3D map that we've built and the satellite imagery of that region, let me try to figure out where these points line up, do the alignment, and then stitch it into any data we have in that area. Uh, our system will actually hunt a three square mile area for you. Just drop a pin, it'll go and search to do that satellite alignment for that geo-registration. Now again, working our way up one more, flight path metadata. If you have information from your collection, it could be in MISB format, SRT, CSV, JSON, it could be nothing more than GPS pings along the flight route, all the way up to the highest level of detail of the camera, the zoom, where it's looking, and all that information. Our system will automatically extract that from the video, even if it's encoded in the frames of the video, and use that for that geo-registration and that alignment into the 3D space. Uh, now, this is one of the big things where most companies stop right about here when they're doing nothing but reconstruction. Uh, usually they skip a satellite one, they just do say GPS or nothing, it's usually where they end. The problem is GPS data is, I hate to say, just not that accurate. Uh, if we just go with commercial platforms, if you're lucky, you'll have five meters of imprecision and float. If you're unlucky, you'll have 20 meters. You, you can't build a map with just five meters, low and 20 meters of imprecision. Uh, and so that's where our platform basically can take that video with that GPS metadata, five or 10 or 20 meters of imprecision, and working through our pipeline and these various steps that we can take, can bring that map down to about 30 to 40 centimeter accuracy with that 20 meter imprecise GPS data. Because of the way we stitch it in, the way we use these various data sets, the knowledge we already have about the region from other collections to align everything into the map. Uh, and then the highest one here is, if you have LiDAR data, whether it be from grid or third party LiDAR, using that to orient and to place our maps into that part of the world to give you the highest level of precision. Because uh, fundamentally, LiDAR usually is the, is the best you can do. Uh, you know, it's a very precise, small detail. We can really orient against that information to present that to you. Uh, and all of this, again, is fully automated front to back. There's no human intervention here, no one to align things. Literally upload a video, walk away, and here's your map through your browser once it's complete with that processing. So before I keep going, I want to make sure, in terms of your question, anything on this that I can dig into a bit deeper or anything along that further? Wondering, in terms of uh, partnerships, is this um, have also any connection with some of the Intel community efforts, like Maven? Yeah, so there's a variety of different plugins into various different programs going on. Um, some I can talk more about than others for obvious reasons. Uh, there's um, the short answer is, is basically yes. There's a lot of different customers we have across DoD um, and the IC for that matter that are using basically or want to use our geo registration pipeline as sort of a foundation to build off of because we've built now this capability to go from imprecise GPS collection to precise location on the ground, fully indexed maps and videos. And so that's exactly the kind of, kind of plugin, and, and we can chat more maybe separately if that's of interest to go into more specifics there. Um, but yeah, the, that's definitely playing into a lot of those conversations going on right now. Other questions on that before I move on? Wonderful. So what's an example of this? How does this actually look? Uh, on the left, and I promise there was no doctoring going on here, uh, you know, hopefully you can take me at my word for this, we've got uh, a handful of videos and flights that were done. This is all done with just commercial grade stuff. You can go buy it, Best Buy aircraft, DJIs, and equivalent style collection platforms. 
Uh, I would argue, and I don't doubt many people here would disagree with me, that the thing on the left is not a map. Uh, it is a collection of models that are in vaguely the right part of the world. Uh, and maybe that's even too generous. Uh, you cannot see what's going on here. You can't understand what you would see on the ground when you arrived versus on the right side is the exact same videos, the exact same collection, metadata, nothing has been changed, but it's run through our full uh, geo-registration pipeline. And we can even do the same exact thing again with no GPS metadata as well. So if you have nothing but the videos and you give us that location estimate, with satellite imagery, with LIDAR data, we can do that full alignment still down to that 30 to 40 centimeter level precision. And so this is really, you know, everything I've shown so far today, none of that would be possible. The change detection, the multi-model stitching and collaboration and mixing those different platforms together and the alignment and none of that, if you can't do this. And so this is really the foundation of what enables everything else in our platform to be able to be as, as valuable, we believe, as, as it can be um, in terms of answering this need across the board. And then just from a usability standpoint, just because I mentioned it earlier, if you do have a video with no GPS metadata, this is basically what a user sees in their browser. Upload a video, the system says, hey, I don't know where this is. Can you please give me an estimate? You drop a pin in the part of the world you'd like to equate it to calling an Uber from your phone, and then the system will go and hunt that three square mile area to figure out where do I have satellite data of this, satellite imagery data in this region? How can I do the alignment? Do I have LIDAR data in this area? How can I do the alignment? What other 3D data have I already generated and 3D maps in that area? How can I align against that? Uh, and so this is quite literally the only human step that is asked of the user or anybody else after a video is uploaded to our system. Uh, this is the only time that ever comes up. And otherwise, again, everything is automated front to back. And then just to give you a sense of on the back end, this is basically what our system is doing, where it, it generates these models, it does the alignment, figures out how to orient them, how to scale them, and then how to stitch them into the full map. So this has been a lot of background on sort of what we've been doing for the last six months uh, and more and what we've been building in and how it's been going. And I think a big piece I want to make sure I touch on is how we've been thinking about this in relation to the Army as well as the broader DOD uh, as a whole. Uh, and so we've been doing a lot of work actually in partnership with both current and sort of potential uh, customers across the DOD that we've gotten to know, both as part of this program and I think in general. Uh, we've been doing collections with actually having some of the servicemen come up in the aircraft with us and guide us and give us feedback on, no, this isn't really how it's done, it's done this way, or no, it wouldn't look like that, it looked like this. So we can actually be testing with true and real data uh, to be able to answer back to you an actually usable platform and present that back to you. Uh, we've done multiple different collections, we've gotten video from our partners that have unclassified data they can share with us, similar to some of the groups that you mentioned earlier, and really making all this data as helpful as we possibly can be, uh, and also to try to learn from it. And this is really the biggest thing I think that sort of unlocks for us the government space. I'm getting a little bit more technical here in a bit, which is we realized pretty quickly when we were starting to do the collections with DOD that our classic models, all the tests we've been doing with DJI drones, even some mid-altitude stuff, just doesn't apply when it comes to DOD collection. Uh, when you get to that high-altitude systems, you get to the non-mapping flight patterns, doing follows and targeting missions and different things of that sort, you just need to be going after reconstruction and mapping in a totally different way. And so from that, we built uh, what we call clustering. Uh, the results of this, and I'll dig into what it is in a moment, is that we're able to take the exact same videos that before we were having so much trouble with and average about 10 times uh, more throughput in terms of the amount of information we're getting from the video, the amount of detail we can extract, structures, all of that. We're also able to use about 80% less video for the same region. So before clustering, we needed about four hours of video to map a full one square kilometer area, and now we need 45 minutes or less. And continuing to really shrink that number, because again, this comes down to how effective and efficient can we be with the content that we have to extract as much of that information as we can, uh, and also just get more out of that full flight path. So again, we don't want to ask you to change how you do your jobs. You are the experts in how you do your jobs. We want to help get value out of those collections that are happening out in the world. So behind the scenes, what is clustering itself? Uh, so this is a recursive system that goes through as we're processing these videos and figures out basically how to break open a video and then combine it in the right order to be processing it all together. So an example I like to use for this is imagine we're flying a figure eight flight pattern. Every time we pass the apex of that figure eight, we're looking at the same part of the world, even though it's an entirely different timestamp, different angle we're passing it by, maybe, maybe we left for a while and came over here for 10 minutes and then came back. All right, what we want to do within our system is figure out when we're looking at the same part of the world, even if it's a different side of the same building, and hence the name, cluster those parts of the video together into one centralized system and then process those as a grouping so that we get as much information about specific parts of the world as we can even if flown in random flight patterns where you're looking at different parts of the world. And so behind the scenes, this is kind of a rough example of what you're seeing where 
In frame number one, we're looking at basically one dot equals a frame of the video that we are processing. They're sort of scattered about by roughly which ones we picked within the video and general idea of location. Um, and at first, it's just all one big cluster. We then start to recursively go through and slice those out into subgroups. So first we go to the green and the red, and then we add the blue and the purple and the gray. And each of those color patterns is showing the frames and the parts of the video that our system is recognizing should fit together. And then to process those together as one piece instead of processing it just in order of the video, which is what we used to do and honestly what most systems outside of HiveMapper still do. Uh, and this is the results. So exact same video from before and after we implemented clustering. Uh, on the left, we were able to use that 20-minute video, about 5% of it was our system able to extract because it wasn't a mapping flight, the camera was moving all over the place, it wasn't optimal for us, they were zooming in and out, they were getting in and out of focus, all sorts of different things that meant fundamentally we just, I mean, honestly, the data on the left, if I'm just blunt, not that useful. I doubt maybe people here would disagree with me on that statement. Uh, but on the right is the exact same video after we implemented the clustering system, where we're able to use the full, roughly 100% of that video to extract this data. We're able to apply that textured mesh information now to it and just get, I mean, I think I usually don't need to argue and explain much more why we were pretty happy and, and see the value in this clustering capability. But this is really fundamental to be able to say, we can be used in the DOD space to actually apply effective mapping and surveying and analytics to this data. So before I keep going, are there any, any thoughts or questions on this I can help dig into deeper? I know sometimes I can get into the weeds. Perfect. So lastly, sort of what's come out of this work as part of the XTech search project. Uh, so we've been able to dig in from the work that we've been building, this clustering work, all these various relationships we've built into a lot of different stuff that's been kicking off. Um, this is not an exhaustive list either. So one of them is we were awarded a phase two CIBR as a joint Air Force and SOCOM endeavor, uh, including USASOC as a part of that program, uh, which we were kicking off. Actually, the launch of that is technically next week, uh, but it was originally officially awarded beginning of this month. And that's been a big one sort of to build on a lot of this information and this growth that we've had over the last six months. Uh, we're also almost complete with an ATO to actually deploy high side on JWIX environments, which is being led by some of our JSOC customers. Uh, they've told us that we should hopefully see that in April. I know it's ATO and security to take estimates for what they are, but uh, that's the target that they are shooting for. We also are deployed now and soon to be also deploying on C2S and SC2S through our Air Force relationships and sort of, again, building on the idea that the improvements we made with clustering, with geo-registration, with textured mesh, with IR, means we are now an applicable platform to be used in their environments as part of their day-to-day -day analytics, uh, as well as mission planning and direct operational pieces. Uh, on the DHS side with Customs and Border Protection and specifically Border Patrol, we've got an ATT in place for deployment onto GovCloud uh, to be able to deploy into their environments, into their different operation centers where they're bringing in uh, actually very similar platforms to some of their DOD partners. They've got Predator feeds and various different things all coming in and pulling that into, again, that platform to do the analytics they need. Uh, and then actually a, a very direct uh, introduction coming through the XTech search is with the night vision team down at CERDEC at uh, Fort Belvoir in Virginia around mine detection. So how can we be looking for terrain shifts and vegetation shifts and, you know, hey, that pile wasn't there when we surveyed this patrol route a week ago or a month ago or whatever it was. I need to now know that information. Okay, maybe I want to change. I have someone go take a look at that before I send a full team down that road not expecting what they're going to run into. So we've seen a lot of great work coming out uh, as part of sort of the partnership in this program and in general across our government space. And we also have a variety of others, as sort of was asked earlier, outside of this grouping on both the IC and DOD side and obviously in the commercial world uh, as well. Uh, and we're definitely not done. Uh, I think that's a big thing for us and probably not a surprise to anybody. We've got quite a lot we're coming out over the next six to nine months. Uh, one of the big ones is object vision. We want to be helping analysts automatically identify what objects are in the world. I want the system to be able to tell me what's a building, what's terrain, what's a road, what's vegetation. So if I don't care about some of that or I really care about certain parts of it, I can be toggling those on and off, have the system highlight that for me and tell me what I should be looking at and what I should be paying attention to. We also want to combine that into change detection, add timeline capabilities where I can say I want to pick two time windows in, in history that I've collected, say a month in 2015 and four months in 2017. In this part of the world, I only care about buildings and vegetation and I only care about changes that are more than two and a half meters of change. Now present to me a list of everything that's happened from all of my collections across those platforms, IR, EO, LIDAR, whatever it might be, and let me just triage that very, very quickly and then act on it with whatever I need to know for my actual needs at that point in time. Um, both of those capabilities are planned for launch in the next about three months or less. Uh, and then I mentioned earlier ground-based. 
Uh, we've gotten a lot of demand actually from a lot of our Army and DOD customers in general as well as some of our international ones, talking with some of the UK MOD, Canada, and a bunch of other teams around how can we do ground-based collection, dash cam, handhelds, for reasons I can't fly, I want to update what's happening at a lower level. I can't see under an awning or a tree with a lot of leaves on it from the sky. Filling that in with those ground-based flights and really making that information available. Uh, and lastly, just to kind of give you a hopefully fun example, uh, we got some video from yesterday as everyone was setting up for the conference for here in Huntsville, and I sort of wanted to give you a walkthrough of literally videos from yesterday afternoon of what our system looks like here. So those videos were uploaded. The system automatically pulled in grid LiDAR data. You can see we can view that LiDAR data directly in our platform. We can move it around 3D map. You see the terrain data in the background, some of the hills that are to the northeast of where we are right now. There's the buildings that we're standing in at this moment. Uh, we can then zoom in and toggle out from LiDAR to the actual 3D map. Look at the train data, the system will update and can resolve as we go in. We can see there's a loading truck there going into the convention center as part of the event from yesterday. I wanna go in here and now measure. What's the size of this truck? Is it a normal size or something funky going on? Okay, it's about 16 meters. If I'm honest, I didn't know how long trucks normally are, so I had to look it up. 53 meter feet, rather, is the average, and that is we're about eight inches off in terms of the actual measurement of what the size of that vehicle is in space. We can then zoom our way back out here and turn on, instead of just the normal view, our change detection view. Uh, see, there's the truck, so that's actually new. We're looking against LiDAR data. We can see construction projects on the building out front behind us from when that LiDAR was collected. With our slider, we can pick how big of a change I want to look at. And we also, I, know, I noticed there's this kind of weird clump in the middle of this courtyard to the left there. Clicking on that, I can bring up the actual video from the collection, pull that out, make it a little bit bigger so hopefully everyone can see it. And as I hit play, I realized what I was seeing here was a tank that somebody had parked in the middle of the courtyard yesterday. So seeing this data come back, identifying these objects, triaging things very, very quickly where in a matter of minutes from bringing my collection in, I can be seeing updates, construction, temporary equipment like vehicles parked, you know, vehicles where I would say that's even pretty much the same coloring as the road around it, maybe not camouflaged, but in that, you know, that sort of vein, but identifying that information and bringing that to the awareness of somebody who's looking at it from an assessment perspective to know what they're gonna run into. So that's my, uh, my quick run through, hopefully, of everything. I've got some time here for any questions people have. Obviously, afterwards, feel free to reach out to me as well, and appreciate the time. No, it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> One World Terrain? Uh, I have. I, I, I'm not uh, nearly as knowledgeable about it as I would like to be, is a short answer. I think from our side in general, from a uh, centralized platform perspective, everything that we build in our system, we don't claim any ownership of the data coming into it. All this information can be exported out, can be integrated into other systems. We export it in sort of industry standard specs. So it can go into ArcGIS. It can go into Cloud Compare and a Mesh Lab into Unity like we already saw. So we're really striving to say that we are a platform and a capability to extrapolate data from, for us, a very bad analytics format that is things like MP4 and be able to integrate that in to a centralized platform. Which I'm wondering if maybe that's sort of what you were thinking there, um, but happy to go into a different detail if you had something else in mind. Oh, that's fine. Wonderful, thank you. How do you, how do you handle like environmental changes, snow, you know, weather kind of thing? Yeah, so because of the way that we are doing our integration, the way we're extracting all that 3D data, um, the short answer is kind of be blunt is we don't really care. Uh, as the world is changing, you know, things like construction, you know, we've got, we've got a new pile of dirt that wasn't there before. That is a change in that 3D space that we will identify, we will reconstruct, and we will flag as part of that change detection work. Um, now, some things, there are a little bit of exceptions in there. Um, snow and uh, very flat, featureless details just from a reconstruction and computer vision perspective are always the hardest, just to be yeah. super upfront about it. Um, so, you know, snow that is muddled, a little bit dirty, that's in a road, that's, there's things around it we don't have any trouble with. But if you're looking at a massive, you know, lake covered in flat, white, unfeatured snow, the, you know, the honest answer is that does prove some other challenges that we are working on being better about. Some of our future work. So what about the, the noise and change detection? I mean, especially if you have you know, a long time between, you know, between images, mm -hmm. um, you know, there could be a lot of changes in there that are not necessarily significant, but yet they add to the, the change in the image and, the, and, and it yeah. increases the noise. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, going back to the Huntsville example and that LiDAR data, 
there's a lot of change that's happened from that LiDAR data was years old versus the video was yesterday. Some of that change, I don't really care that there was a new building built three years ago because the LiDAR is eight years old. Um, so right now what happens in our system is we do flag all change. Uh, we don't discern one piece versus another right now. What we're doing to change in that is two factors. One of them is the object segmentation piece, right? I, okay, I don't really care about all trees have grown in the last year. Let me just turn off vegetation for right now and focus on terrain shifts and man-made structures. Uh, another piece is that timeline. I want to be able to pick very specific windows to focus on exactly the changes I care about. And then the third piece actually is we're adding the ability for a user to interact with that data. I want to be able to click on a change, leave a note saying, eh, this is somebody added a porch to the front of the house, don't care, dismiss, right? Or you know, I want to let somebody else know when they come later to look at this, I've already triaged it and I've marked it for what it should be. So we're building a bunch of those features right now in, in partnership with a lot of the work we're doing in that, that phase two actually, uh, with SOCOM and Air Force as well as in general. Wonderful. Well, I appreciate the time everybody. Obviously I'll be around. Oh, sorry, another question? The Intelligence uh, Center and School out at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, has the place the Army trains its analysts. Um, I'm trying to think, they have a battle lab there mm -hmm. to look at new ideas. That may be another possible place to, to go talk. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we've done, uh, and we've talked with a lot of versions of those organizations, not that one specifically, though I'd love to do so, obviously. We've done a lot of stuff with Softworks down in Tampa. Uh, a bunch of stuff with AFRL uh, is going on as well. Uh, and obviously, we're starting to have some conversations with ARL down at Fort Belvoir. Um, and some other work around some of the Maven discussions around how can we fit into kind of building this bigger picture work. Uh, but getting more in touch with especially some of those kind of training and stuff. We've done a lot of that actually in the commercial world with university partnerships saying, hey, we'd, we'd love to just have your students just play around with this to get a sense for it, give us feedback, and learn how to use it so they can get value out of that later on as well. So yeah, that absolutely kind of thing we would love to do. Great. Thank you very much.